Wonderful. Good evening, folks. Uh, so I'm a cloud solutions architect based out of our Milwaukee office. I've been in that role uh, five and a half years now. And uh, prior to that, I was with a Microsoft partner. So I've been working with Azure for nine or 10 years now, uh, focusing around apps and infrastructure. Uh, work with folks like Steve on, on accounts. So Steve and I have worked on a number of accounts together. And uh, basically, you know, <clears throat> what we're going to go through here today is what we're seeing out there is is mainly two things. One is, you know, you've got a little bit of an Azure footprint. Maybe you got a few subscriptions, uh, but you know, you just kind of made them as point solutions. So in other words, you know, you had a project, you created a subscription. We're going to go through hierarchy and scoping and stuff through the session, so you understand a little bit more. Uh, but you know, you really want to. Uh, produce a foundation that's going to be scalable, right? You don't want to be always having to wire up on premise and you don't always want to be having to have duplication of services that could be centralized, things like that. And the second type of customer, of course, is one who um, has any anything from dozens of subscriptions up to well over a thousand uh, been in, you know, and, and with that, we call that kind of an Azure 2.0. You know, they've learned a lot and I don't mean 2.0 as in going from Azure Service Manager Classic, as you guys would know it, to ARM, Azure Resource Manager. <clears throat> It's more that, you know, they, they've done it a certain way over the years and, and probably before they got started, policies didn't exist or blueprints and really some of the networking things that made some of this possible didn't exist. So it's it's not a poor design or poor planning. It was more, you know, some of the limitations we had and some of the features uh, either weren't there or weren't very rich. So, <clears throat> So part of what I'm going to go through today is, you know, how do we boil down the cloud adoption framework? There is 1300 pages of documentation and this applies to, you know, whatever phase your company is in today. So again, it's like best practices and that's a good point. Questions. Yeah. Post them in the window. Feel free to interject too and, and speak up. It's, uh, you know, I might miss the question in the window and it could be uh, related to the topic on the screen. <clears throat> so number of ways we want to use this is to be able to modernize or transform, certainly grow, right? But we want to grow in a way that we're not going to have sprawl in a way that produces more work for one. And, and in terms, you know, in turn, that can produce more cost or cost you more. And the biggest thing is, um, you want to be able to allow the application teams to run their applications and data and whoever's going to manage, you know, whatever that cloud team, cloud ops team, or whoever that centralized management is going to be, you know, for them to essentially provide a great infrastructure that has things like backup and monitoring and all of that in place. So you come in, uh, you know, you onboard your app and you tag it so that you can do cost reporting and things like that. But all the other peripheral services um, exist and they're done in a way that they're centralized and that we can integrate with your, you know, an ITSM if need be, which in turn then that produces your business returns, right? The ability to rapidly onboard, reduce your cost. And when I say cost, I'm mainly talking about resource hours uh, as opposed to, because a lot of these services, you turn them on and they're used based on consumption. So, you know, consumption is consumption. There's certainly ways to centralize and reduce some costs, but for the most part, it really comes down to just the amount of work that you need to do for the care and feeding of the, uh, of the platform. <clears throat> so cloud adoption framework. Uh, this is non-linear on the top, so you may be in different phases of this. I know customers who have a great strategy and a great plan, but they never did do a proper landing zone and they never did expand that best practice. They kind of, you know, set some of this up and then they kind of gave subscriptions to the teams and now they're they're left with, you know, dozens or hundreds of subscriptions. So I think it is important to understand why you're going to the cloud and how you're going to justify it. You hear a lot of cloud first and customers who are, you know, go to the cloud first unless you can justify or have a reason why you would want to stay on premise. So it's things like that that could be part of your strategy and how do you justify, you know, you still do have to be diligent and do comparison, whether it's uh, compared against on premise or other clouds. And then of course you need to have a good portfolio to prioritize on this because certain apps or, or applications are going to be a better fit for the cloud than others, or it could be just, you know, let's say it's going to sunset in a year. Why move it now? If it's going to, you know, if there's no advantage to uh, moving it, then then leave it, let it sunset and have the new version come out on Azure. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why you'd want to justify and prioritize. <clears throat> Once you have that, 
get our people to you know know how to do this stuff. So we offer a number of things, and I'm going to show some learning tools out here that are free. We do have Microsoft Learn. We have Plural Site. We have partnership with them where you can go through and really get skilled up, certifications, things like that. Um, we can also help as well, depending on you know what your account is and how you're aligned with Microsoft. And, and in some instances, we can help build out a skills readiness plan. And then of course, you know people like myself, who's a cloud solutions architect, we'd help you build a plan to adopt, be ready, deploy, but uh, do it in a manner that you can, you know, have a platform that again, you can really have a great control of uh, ease of management and ease of deployment. And then lastly, so one of the things with CAF that you'll see, you see here today, we got migrate and innovate. And those are kind of the two core ones that, that came out initially. Um, we do have more, there is data, SAP, uh, we are going to be basically the adoption piece of this is going to lend itself to uh, most patterns and practices or, you know, services, combination of services. And that's kind of where we're going with this. Uh, get that good platform, solid platform in place, one that can scale and then be able to adopt different types of workloads. And lastly, you got to be able to govern, which is what all of this is really focused on. And lastly, you got to be able to operationalize this. So, you know, <clears throat> it's fine that people can onboard, but how do they get support? How do they get their backups that they would get on premise? You know, things like that. How do they connect to the network if need be? So <clears throat> getting started, obviously we've got the framework. You need to establish some kind of benchmark and a vision and we can help you build, you know, whether it's through our documentation or one of our Microsoft folks or a partner uh, can help you establish a minimal viable product. So one thing I want to know too, if you are using um, Azure DevOps, you, um, if you go into our project generator, and I can share some links, correct guys, after this to send out to the group, maybe pass on to you guys with the presentation and some helpful links. In there, can I do that, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. All right, so um, I'll send it out, but look for the project generator. And what it does is it'll produce a basically a CAF project in Azure DevOps. So it'll give you all those tasks kind of that we're going to go through here today in a project format. Uh, it is, uh, let me think, I think it's pretty sure it's using either Scrum or Agile template, but it is one of those. And then lastly, right, you need to evolve. So what I'm going to talk through today, unfortunately or fortunately, never ends. Our services and technologies change. In fact, um, today we just came up with a whole bunch of new features on VPN integration with Express Route, you know, so that could have an impact to people's networks. It could be that that virtual WAN or they want to take an SD WAN approach and actually move away from Express Route, you know, those are all things that you need to, of course, keep up with and evolve as, as time, time goes by. Um, <clears throat> just want to show some of the tools here that we're going to talk to through today. Um, so when we look at this, you know, really to, to produce governance, you need to look at, you know, your risks. Do you have any policy and compliance? Uh, what's your process then, of course, to operationalize and how are you going to make sure that people are adhering to those corporate policies? And then you need to be able to incorporate the five disciplines, right? So cost management, security, resource consistency, that is so important. Of course, identity, everything is tied to that, you know, we have to make sure that that's done right. And, and one of the things that I see with identity that I'll just point out because I see it time and time again, two things. One, they're assigning individuals to a resource group or subscription, should be using AD groups. Uh, we do have a limit of 2000 and believe it or not, customers are hitting that quite frequently. So use AD groups. The other thing is, you know, for your accounts that provision your subscriptions, and I'm gonna go through this again, but uh, use a service principle, right? Don't have that tied to an individual. So a couple of things like that when you're going through identity as best practices can certainly help you over the long run. Um, and then be able to uh, deploy. So part of that is certainly using a DevOps tool. And we, you know, to us, uh, great if you use ADO, great if you use Jenkins. Jenkins. It really, honestly, it, it really doesn't matter to us. Um, it has to work for your org and sometimes the the cost of change you know for the sake of change is just not worth it so um the main thing is you know we want you on our platform the tools that you use is really up to you and i'm going to show a couple of third parties here in a second but um so blueprints we're going to go through those that is a combination of policies and arm templates and uh resource group 
basically properties uh, like tagging, and then lastly, role-based access control. So think of it as a way to package up those four things um, to make a subscription so that they can either you know look very similar or have the same services. So an example that could be every time I push out a new subscription, I want to make sure I've got a VNet that gets paired back to a hub that's connected to on-premise. I might want a backup you know, solution in there. Um, it could be that I need a key vault or some type of key service things like that, you can deploy that with a blueprint. Um, policies, very similar. Policies can be incorporated into a blueprint. The biggest difference is that the policies can be applied at a higher level. And I'll show more of that when I go through scoping. Uh, cost management, obviously very important. You know, we acquired a company called Cloudin a number of years ago. Uh, that has become cost management. And there's also a Power BI uh, desktop app as well. So if you want to get a lot more granular with uh, reservations, which are a way to commit to one in three years and get a dis deep discount, um, you know, cost management handy for that and we'll use a what's called tagging and I'm going to show that it's just metadata it's a key value pair so that you as the customer can establish what that looks like uh, so cost you know cost center would be a very common one or application name and some customers you know integrate to their accounting system or their CMDB uh, to be able to pull up that information and I've seen customers even go so far as to build a form in ServiceNow or in SharePoint or whatever tool they use Salesforce you know and basically build a workflow around that so that the users come in, they request, they fill out all the information for them that's required for the tagging metadata. And then at the end, it produces, um, it basically produces, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the information you need. So next one, I uh, mentioned Blueprint Security Center, really to give you monitoring around security. Sentinel is our uh, com competition to Splunk. So um, think of that as your SIM online. Um, one thing I do like about Sentinel is um, we do have direct integration with our products among other products. But if you're looking to just try this out, Office 365, we give that for free. So Sentinel, I, I love Splunk. You know, feature comparison, they're probably fairly close to being on par. Splunk does have a larger community of support. We're certainly getting there, but it's a newer product. But um, if you're looking a way to monitor Office 365, get started, that's to look at. Azure Monitor, of course, you know, we can build dashboards, we can do alerting, tie into your ITSM, like something like a ServiceNow, Advisor, giving you feedback on performance and security and cost. And uh, I think I mentioned pretty much all of them now. The resource group is going to be the logical container where we deploy our workloads and resource manager templates. So ARM templates, we also have a new, so an ARM template is comprised of JSON. Um, some folks have, 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 had troubles, I would say, with not just creating the JSON, but when you deploy and troubleshooting. So I, I would urge you to look at, we have a new project out called Bicep, and it looks more like, um, I would say more like the Terraform, I can't remember the name of their language, but the language they use in their Terraform um, for building templates and kind of a uh, in between that and I would say uh, type uh, TypeScript maybe something yeah that's kind of what it reminds me of so you'd be in Visual Studio it's much more based you know the syntax you're familiar with and then what it does it compiles out to an ARM template so obviously you can see where we're going will probably compile out to you know multiple platforms so that's where we're going um, Terraform is, is still going to be mature. We do have a team in Microsoft that is dedicated to Terraform and helping them out to make sure those providers are updated. So we do have that kind of deep, deep integration with partners as well. Um, just want to mention a couple of things here. You know, HashiCorp has some tools for, for a number of things. Splunk for your security sim. Um, ServiceNow, of course, Terraform, so you can build one template and deploy it in, you know, uh, multiple clouds. Uh, third-party identity identity provider, sorry, like HashiCorp Vault and things like that. And then one thing I'll mention here is as we go through policies today, I, I really like this product. Um, many of my customers are multi-cloud, and this does allow you to manage your policies and compliance and things like that across uh, AWS, GCP, and, and Azure. So if you do have a multi-cloud, you know, and you, you'd like to implement policies, I would look at these guys, certainly worthwhile. And then lastly, deployment tools, right? A lot of us know a lot of these. This could be uh, Jenkins. It could be any number of tools. So we certainly want more and more partners uh, on the platform. And you can look at our gallery to see that the marketplace. All right, so I'm going to do a little demo. This is going to be a combination here of demos and, uh, and presentation. 
So I'm going to start off with a couple of basics here just while I'm here. Um, so this dashboard has been built out of using Azure Monitor. So if you haven't seen that, you know, you can obviously edit these dashboards. Uh, we have some tiles, but if you want to get specific and build something like what you're looking at here, which is a retail application, you know, you'll want to use something like Azure Monitor. Uh, you can share those. You can create different dashboards, of course, for your view. Uh, so this one here is an operational dashboard. And I'll show you later on in um, Azure Monitor. Next, sir. Um, so I've got these all pinned here. I just went to all services, uh, you know, hovered over, and then I just clicked this little star here, and then I organize them. So I've got a couple things here. Quick Start Center. This is probably the best place if you're wanting to learn CAF and you don't want to read 1,300 pages. I would use this Azure Setup Guide. It is CAF essentially. So it links out to the Cloud Adoption Framework, um, and then it takes you through the steps. So how to organize your resources. So. Here's an example here, and you're going to hear me talk about this a good bit today, is scoping. So we had a limitation up until management groups came out. If I wanted to apply, I had the multi-select subscriptions. Let's say I was looking at cost management or I was applying policies. My scope was pretty limited. You know, I had to, to duplicate what I was doing to each and every subscription. What a management group does, it allows you to push it up a level. So think of it in terms of this. If I had a policy instead of, and, and it applies, and let's say I did an IT baseline, and that baseline is comprised of policies like, you can only deploy to these regions in Azure, or it could be, I don't want any public IPs on my virtual machines in Azure because I want it to go through a WAF and I don't want any public exposure. It could be what services you want to use in Azure. Maybe you have your own service catalog and your ops team says, you know what, we only support these products. As we get more mature, we're going to support more and more Azure products. You know, you can do those types of policies and then you can combine those policies together to uh, into an initiative. So a lot of my customers, what they'll do is, you know, they'll start building out baselines and what that will look like. Mainly, I, I go through this kind of starter kit with them. The management group route, you never want to apply to there. So again, this is our scoping. Management groups have a collection of subscriptions. A subscription is going to have a collection of resource groups, and a resource group is going to have a collection of services. So when you look at this, this is kind of a pretty basic you know, design. Um, it can get more complicated if you have different uh, geopolitical boundaries and you might want to control those through management groups. Uh, I believe you can go six levels down, I think. I mean, that could have changed yesterday, but, uh, but you know, you can go, so I would keep it less complex. So most of my customers, especially if they're just starting, um, number one, we do an Azure 1.0. Some of them call it Azure Legacy. It's whatever. But what we're trying to do is any existing subscriptions, we'll move it over here so it's not impacted by any of the new stuff. And most of my customers are building out a new shell, a new infrastructure. And then if they decide to, um, as they you know, refactor or upgrade applications or decide to move them to this infrastructure, they can. But for the most part, they're using kind of what I'll call the 2.0 redesign um, as the new location to deploy applications <clears throat> using the latest you know, uh, best practices. So we'll move those subscriptions over here. Then we come up with an IT baseline. So think of this as like at this level, those policies that I talked about that could apply to everything from production to sandbox, the shared infrastructure, you know, those can be applied at this level and then inherit it down. So then anytime I produce a subscription provision one, um, it does drop to the management group. There is a new drop down now, though, where you can pick it before you go. Um, but what will happen is say I drop this this one right here into production. Uh, it will, within five to 30 minutes, basically apply those policies or blueprints and uh, get that subscription up and running. You can, of course, since last late last year, I think it was, you can provision subscriptions, I think up to 400 is our limit now, um, through a DevOps pipeline. So you could do all of this stuff through a pipeline. And so basically, as you're scoping down through, you're going to have more specific, of course, you know, policies and, and, and role based access control for your production. So I have a lot of customers who if they're small and they have one ops team, they might have their role based access control AD group applied here. And that way they have access all the way down. Uh, but many companies have segregation of duties, so they're probably going to apply, you know, these groups kind of more at these levels because this shared infrastructure is only going to be for ops teams, whereas, you know, a non 
production is going to be, say, the workload, you know, the application teams plus the cloud ops team or sandbox, you know, it's going to be a little different because in a sandbox scenario, you might kind of let, you know, let go some of the governance a little bit, like allow them to create a VNet. Think of a sandbox in most cases as, you know, I want to test out some features. I want to build the requirements so I can work with the ops team to provision, but I'm really trying to figure out what my best approach is here. And then they'd move into non-prod and production. Non-prod, of course, would be like your dev, your QA, and, and all of those things in one. I can share that as well. Um, so that really covers your kind of your different scoping levels. Next one I think is really important is your naming conventions. Um, a lot of folks do skip over this and each team has their own naming. Um, consistency is, is always a good thing. Um, you can enforce some of those naming standards as well. And we do have guidance on naming tagging as well. So when you come out here, you can see here we've got our resource naming. We have pretty much all of them. There's rarely things that I come through that uh, that don't have it. Um, so basically, it's just prefixes for the most part. Um, most customers just use ours because it's already documented and done. Um, and then our tagging that I had mentioned earlier, the key value pairs, you know, this is some pretty common ones that we uh, recommend to customers so that when I'm doing cost management or I'm doing any kind of reporting, I can use those tags. And so I could, you know, obviously do a report based on a cost center. I could do a report to tell me what, you know, what applications res uh, require disaster recovery. Um, tell me how much it costs to run only dev. You know, um, owner, tell me, you know, what applications are owned by such and such a person. So things like that. These, I would say, this is critically important. It's not just for show back and charge back. It's for any kind of reporting that you're doing out there. And there are policies that will enforce you. You know, what you determine, you do not have to use these. You can come up with your own if you'd like. Uh, but basically, you can use policies to enforce like application name being used. And you can see here, it's a key value. So of course, no spaces and whatnot. But you can actually go down through and not only enforce that these are used, but secondly, that any service, I, you know, I normally recommend pretty much always recommend you want to have your tagging at the subscription and resource group level and then you use uh, policies that do inheritance to push them down because nobody wants to go and provision a virtual machine in a resource group and from there you know it has compute it has your disk you know got your nick you know who wants to go in and add you know 30 tags manually um, you can do it in the arm template as well but i would again even if you're using arm just keep it at the resource group level and I'll show you an example of that tag that allows you to do the inheritance of those. You can also retroactively do it as well. So if you're tagging, you know, if you decide, okay, we're going to get serious now, we came up with a standard, but we've got kind of, you know, all kinds of different tags out there. You can actually run a remediation to go out and, and fill in the missing tags and update things. So there's a lot of uh, built in items that we have now that can go in as opposed to in the past when I first started doing this, it was all it was hand coding a lot of this in um, Azure automation with PowerShell. Um, resource tag, just an extension here. Um, so there's also tags that we put in place. Um, so you can see here, almost like if you're familiar with service tags that we have on the networking side, kind of like that, you know, so you can take action based on a shutdown time or a deprovisioning date and stuff like that. So you can take advantage of those. And an example um, could be too, like if you saw over here, uh, I had, I believe, oh, sorry, right here, there was an end date. So you could use that, like I tell you one thing I see a lot is in the sandbox, people kind of leave their workloads running, which is costing the company money. Um, so you can put in end date, do a little automation job on the tag, notify the application owner because you know the uh, owner name and their email, um, and then be able to let them know, hey, in seven days, we're going to deprovision your resource group unless you update your end date. So things like that that you can do with resource tags. And the other thing is cost optimization as well. Obviously, I'm going to show that hopefully here today. And then managing access, you know, I kind of talked about that. I will say the most common thing that I see is um, we will have an AD group that's a cloud ops team. They will be more at the subscription level, like owning the subscription so they can see any resource group and, and you know, modify and so on and so forth. But normally the app teams, um, 
they're usually just given contributor or less because a contributor can do anything inside the resource group, but it can't delete the resource group. Only an owner can in that case. And, and really, you know, we don't really want to have that in a lot of cases. So uh, I have had customers delete some pretty serious workloads. Uh, they thought they were in, you know, their, their dev. Uh, or a sandbox and naming conventions, all that looked the same, of course, uh, and they deleted stuff that we couldn't restore necessarily. So uh, the other thing that I'll show here when I go through resource groups is the uh, use the use of locks. So at least you have one fail safe to remind people. Um, so what it does, it just puts a do not delete lock on. You got to delete the lock, then you can delete the resource group as long as you have, of course, the privileges to do it. And again, I'm just going to repeat this, but AD groups are the way to go. Try to avoid named individuals um, for a few reasons. Uh, obviously, number one is because your assignments are reduced and reusable. Number two, uh, you have, you know, you as the cloud ops team, unless you're on the identity team as well, you know, don't have to deal with adding or moving users to uh, to Azure all the time because it's being done at the group level. So the identity team could take care of that. Um, and then hopefully that pushes the identity team to come up with a self-service solution so that people can control their own groups. And that's kind of like the that's where you want to get get to. Uh, other than that, with role assignments, you know, you can create custom roles. I would say only create them if you need them. Uh, that's more custom stuff that you're introducing into the environment. I think we have, I mean, I don't know how many dozens of roles we have, but, uh, and the other thing you can do is you can get more granular. Like even with inside a resource group, you can have obviously different groups assigned to different roles. So if I had like an AD group that was meant for my network folks, or let's say um, they could only touch virtual machines, but maybe you got a SQL server in there and you got a MySQL and you got whatever else, um, there is a role that's specific as a virtual machine contributor or virtual machine reader. So you can even kind of segregate your duties that way. And that's that's very common as well. Um, so a contributor might be someone who can, you know, do anything in the resource group, but you may um, limit people as to, you know, only can work on networking, only on virtual machines, only on PaaS services, whatever the case might be. Costing, we're going to get into this a little deeper. Um, you know, we do have that. There's tons of third party tools out there as well that are very mature uh, that you can use the plug in. And uh, again, I'll, I'll speak to the Power BI, but that gives you a great, I think, so the link in the window. Yeah, there it is. So the Power BI one is in the window too for cost management. Um, and I'll just show that real quick. Uh, so I think, yep, this is a little, there we go. All right, so you can see here, once you plug in, it's built in to get the data from cost management. Of course, you have to have some information to authenticate, but mainly what I want to show you is you just have all these different things under, if you have an enterprise agreement with us, you, that's where this comes into play, by the way, and you may not have that, um, but reserved instances, you know, we've, that was a bit of a struggle for some customers to really report on that. So since that time, we've really done a better, you know, much better job on budgets and price sheets and charges and usage details. And you can really dig into it. Plus, you can take this down and, of course, add in, you know, a mash of data uh, that might relate to it. So as an example, when we're talking tagging here, I have seen customers who have their own proprietary ID and they'll use that in there as well. Do we have a question? Hey, uh, I was just about to add that uh, in Power BI, we can consume all that cost management data and Microsoft also publishes a separate app in which they have already done some of that reporting for us. Yeah, to, it, this is it here. No, if we'll go to... Uh, next, oh, you're talking about connect, the Insights data? Yeah, the scroll one. down. Yes. Not here. No. The link that I have posted in the chat Okay, I couldn't get yeah. that one. It bombed out on me when I went through here. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so we'll you. scroll down. There they we have go. some screenshots. So they have done already some good stuff. So they, they have listed those reports that they already have. For example, it gives usage by subscriptions and resource groups, top five usage drivers, where they list the metric uh, meter categories. Then they have reserved instances information as well. Yeah, that's the exact same one that I was showing. 
it's this one here. We in this one, we have to we need an EA administrator to download that data. It's a connector that comes with Power BI, but it doesn't give any reports. So these tables are from enterprise agreement. Right. But we it it doesn't gives any any uh, report out of it. It's just the data that we can consume and create our own reports. But um, under that app, mm -hmm. under that app, Microsoft has already published some of those reports. So we just have to connect. Uh, our enterprise agreement with that and it automatically shows those a uh, link link that report with our data oh i see what you're saying yeah this is the app that does the overlay yes this is the, the actual template yeah exactly it's the template and if you need more customization then we can go and utilize this connector and do right. whatever we yeah ex thank you for mentioning that actually uh all right All right, governance. Uh, we're going to get the. I'm going to do a demo of Blueprint, so I won't get into it. Just as a, you know, basically this is a combination of services that you can pull together to temp uh, basically um, Blueprint a subscription, and then monitoring. So we do have, you know, Azure Monitor. So it's a great way to monitor and visualize. So you saw that dashboard that I showed at the beginning. That was done through Azure Monitor. And then if you're looking for, you know, looking into your service health for some self service as well. Um, we do have some different areas in here. So instead of going, you know, to azure.com, you can go through here and look at what the recs were. Basically, if there was any network problems, we do give the root cause analysis. Uh, you can create an alert. So you can see here that this one usually, of course, you know, we fix the problem, then we do the uh, the RCA and then basically, you know, publish that out. So you can create an alert around that. So in six days, you know, it'll let you know. Uh, basically that that has been rectified and, and see that wreck if it impacted you. And it is specific to, in a lot of cases, you can make it specific to the regions and services. You can also see any plan maintenance that we have as well. Uh, any health advisories, which is right here. So kind of the same thing. If you're looking at this, it's, you know, a lot of the same stuff. You can link out here to it. Uh, what services were impacted, things like that. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just want people to know it's here. You can see your, you know, health history as an example, um, how your resources are doing. So you can add a resource health alert as an example here. So I can pick, you know, the resource type, what group, what resource it is, and then what status is that I want to um, have an alert based on. And then you're going to see this screen right here a lot because this is how we actually do the notifications they're called action groups uh, and in this case here <clears throat> when i go and create an action group i can pick a few things so one thing to to do here if you are doing alerting and it's done by centralized a centralized management team have a specific resource group where you're going to save these afterwards um, and and you know have that ops team set up the notification type so it's already there for you i mean you can set up like email and sms and stuff like that but i'd recommend that you know your central it kind of builds these out so they're reusable and then the other thing that you can do is tie into automation you know uh basically functions which is a, a you know a service uh, itsm you could build a connector there like uh I don't know how many we support now, but there's quite a few. I mean, ServiceNow is probably the most popular um, that I see, but there is, you know, a connector for that. And you go to our marketplace and get those connectors. And then lastly, everything has tags, but again, you would use inheritance and a policy on that one and then be able to review and create. And then, of course, once that's there, I can just select that action group. So on this one here, you know, it could be create a ticket as an example. Uh, and then what you can do is give a name, a description, and where it's saved to. So again, have a centralized group for your IT. Uh, and so this is used for Azure Monitor. It's used for a whole bunch of services whenever you see these alerts. And you can do health alerts as well. Um, so basically the same thing I, that I showed you up there where it just gives you that alert uh, of any service that's coming down the line. And let's see here. 
uh, advisor, we're actually going to go through. So here's the five pillars for availability and security, performance costs, and operational excellence. So basically, it looks at your subscriptions that you have and gives you feedback in each of these areas. Security Center, very security focused, um, <clears throat> but it does, you know, it does have a free and standard. I'll kind of show what's involved there. But uh, this is a way that you can monitor anything from VMs to your network to app services. And then, of course, very, very important, staying up to date with your RSS feeds, but I really like, um, if you look back, sorry, at the Quick Start Center, there is an online course here. So this will link out to um, Azure Learn, or Microsoft Learn, I'm sorry. Then you can pick, you know, Azure, or you could go into a specific area of Azure. I can list my role, you know, so for me, Solutions Architect, and I could say, you know, beginner and intermediate type courses, uh, and then it'll pull all those up for you. You do get points and some stuff, so if you want to show your manager, it does um, show that. And then the other one that we have is, uh, let's see here, plural. Uh, we do have this as well. I'll send it out, but you can register and start for free. You kind of go through, you know, what your role is, and then it kind of builds out a program for you. Uh, they even have stuff. I don't know if this stuff is necessarily free, but I do know the courses up here are, so you can register and start with that. I like Plural, so I think they do a fantastic job. We do too, of course. Uh, all right, so that kind of covers sort of how you can get through it. And, and, you know, in the slides, you saw migration and innovation. You can also go in here. So if you're looking at, you know, how I would do a migration, this is part of CAF as well. Uh, and then the other thing, this just takes you to the wizard. It's just a starting point to build some, you know, some of our most common services. All right. So I'm just going to show uh, my hierarchy for management groups. So my handle at Microsoft, by the way, is K-E-Y-O at Microsoft. So I've got my own IT baseline and I have a non-production in here. Um, it is easy to move this stuff around. So that's, you know, this is one of the areas where you can do a move and pick a new parent group. Uh, it'll take, you know, again, five to 30 minutes or so before it propagates and, and does its work. Um, so again, back to that structure, you know, you really want to spend some time on this and what what makes sense for you. Again, this is very basic one. And usually we expand from here. But in a lot of cases, honestly, this is where customers start is just here. Very simple. Uh, they separate their model by service and then go from there. So I just want to show a couple things on the resource groups since we were talking about those. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff, but a um, couple of things that I always like to point out to customers. Uh, so in here, I just want to show real quick, you know, here's my tagging. That's where it's going to appear. Access control, right, to add my roles. Um, so I can add those as a role assignment, code administrator, custom role. I can see what's out there as long as I have the access. And then, <clears throat> of course, I can add my, they exist over here as well. But then I just wanted to show then lock. So I do have a do not delete. Again, just I'm repeating some of the stuff that I repeat. It's just because like, just make sure that you're doing some of these things to protect yourself. And then <clears throat> I'm going to show cost management, but all of all this is doing is you'll see a lot of these tabs that are the same. They're just scoping down is all they're doing. So it's the same service. Obviously, it's identical, but you see up here the scope is going to load and that scope, of course, matches my resource group. So I could as long as I have permissions, right? I can go into the root group. I could go into key OIT and I could even select this management group if I want to. And then that's going to take me over to cost management where I can look at, you know, a higher level scope, which for me, this would be my entire environment. So based on the diagram here, you know, I'm looking from here down so I can see any cost cost that would be down here in these subscriptions and resource groups. All right, so we're going to start with some policies. How are we doing? So we have the 45 minutes. Um, so we do have a compliance. Uh, I'm just going to change this scope here. And I'm going to add in a demo environment. So now I can see some of these things that are non-compliant here. Um, so I can go in and, okay, so I'm going to look at enable monitoring. I can tell this is an initiative, which is a collection of policies. And out of that, it looks like a couple of them uh, are not working. And I'll just go over some of the effect types too. So you saw in there, uh, where it actually was on the last screen. 
You can see your effect type here. It's an audit if not exist that shows up in your compliance. Um, it will show up in Security Center too, depending on what it is. And then from there, uh, you'll notice up top, I can create a remediation task. So if I did make a fix, I could now run this. Um, think of it this way, remediation task, what it does, it rectifies anything in the past. The policy only looks at what you are incorporating as of now or moving forward. Like it'll go back and do some missing tags if you execute remediation, but it's really looking forward. Think of it as like any new service that gets created will hit against a policy, but you would need to remediate. So if you did have, you know, it's not gonna go through unless you specify for remediation and it's gonna show you what it's deploying as well. So it's gonna show you that it's, uh, here is the, the built-in of this, the effect is deploy if not exists. So if that extension is not there, and in this case, it's a uh, monitoring agent, um, then go ahead and deploy it. So it also makes for, for great, you know, an ease of automation when you want to make sure you only have approved extensions on a VM. Or it could be like anytime I create a virtual network, I want to turn on Network Watcher, which is a tool that we have that'll help you troubleshoot the network. It interrogates the traffic. You could ship it to the SIM and it integrates with our network security groups, which is the control of flow, like control of ports and things. So I can see here it got 88%, which is really good. Um, <clears throat> chances are you're probably not going to hit 100% a whole lot um, if you're doing it right because your platform is evolving every day. Um, you can see here it's excluded a couple of scopes. I'm going to show a demo of that too. So this says, you know, apply to everything within a certain scope, which is this subscription, Contoso Hotels, but do not apply it to these two resource groups as an example. So there must be some reason for that. Um, and I can also create an exemption. So if I know about it and I just don't, you know, I don't need to deal with it, you can do an exemption as well. Uh, and so this is already, the scope has been uh, already set, right? Because I already chose something. And then you can see the policies here. Uh, so you can exempt all of the initiative or part of the initiative. I have only read-only access in here. So this is not what you would necessarily, you know, these gray, I should be able to change this and stuff. So, you know, then I can deselect and maybe because those virtual machines, I don't know, I don't need this, you know, audit dependency agent or something like that. Um, so you can do some exclusions depending on it. And usually what I take my customers through, uh, let's see here. What we'll normally do is uh, when we get to this point with policies and blueprints, uh, I, I just have them track this stuff because you don't want to deploy too many of these at one time, as you can imagine, or your environment, you're probably going to get a lot of feedback. Um, and it's probably going to be very hard to, um, you know, remediate. So what I recommend is the customers come in, they figure out which policies are going to work for them. Um, all right, I do have a link to the two in here, though, on a newer document. But anyway, um, and then we just track, was this a built-in policy uh, or was it custom? You know, what category it belongs to? And then prioritize. So we try to prioritize within, you know, five or ten policies or something. Mark those as number one. And then where are they getting deployed? So in this case, you can see this aligns with the Visio diagram I had. So in this case, you know, I might do a baseline, but maybe like a networking thing or uh, machine SKU size, I might say, you know what, I'm just gonna put this in the shared environment because uh, we don't need many VM workloads in there. So the only thing we need are like domain controllers. So I might wanna limit that in there for folks. Uh, so I mentioned remediation. This is just another avenue to go in and do that. Assignment. So a policy exists, right? It needs to live somewhere. But then secondly, it actually has to be assigned to one of those scopes. So nothing has happened. When you build an initiative, it's just sitting there. It's saved, but it's not been applied. Um, and where you can see those, of course, you can see all these are assigned um, to Contoso. You can see it's been given a category here. Uh, and of course, you could dig into those as well. And, uh, uh, you know, decide if I go into here, I can edit this. I can change the parameters if I had more than read only. Oh, OK, it's let me do some of this. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and then remediation if need be and then go through. Um, so that is a way to kind of navigate in there and then definitions right so here is all the ones we have built in we literally have hundreds um this is the scope because the scope is important here because you can see here i created my own 
Um, so I needed to have the scope to include my work as well. I can filter on initiatives and policies, customer built in. And the other thing, when you're looking at that Excel sheet here that I showed, most of the customers, what they're doing is they start out with the general stuff, right? Because you want, you know, you like most customers have compute network and stuff like that. Or it could be that you are, uh, I just want to look at like general type stuff, you know, so allowed locations and things like that. And normally what they'll do is um, as they're evolving, they'll start looking at more of these services. So let's say, you know, all right, we're going to start using cognitive services here. Um, you know, then I can see exactly what's there. So if I go to implement a new service that I've not done before, I might want to come in here and see what I can do to help with the governance of that service when it gets deployed. And then I can create these, right? So an initiative directive, I do need to save it somewhere. Um, you can't save it to a sibling. You can only save it like when you apply it, it needs to be in that certain hierarchy. So as an example, right, if I save it here, I can assign it anywhere in there. So you just have to be careful with your design. Uh, just type in something here. Um, I usually have customers build their own categories. Easier to filter by and search. You can certainly do it in the drop down, but you know, I usually have them do customer, whoops, something like this and then they'll they'll have their own like general you know or something like that or in this case it's going to be what we've built here is like it baseline and then of course give it a version number uh and then we can go into the policies and add those kind of weird um how we've done this i think the group should be probably reversed so i normally get folks because you know if you've only got 10 policies no problem right you can just you know you don't need the filter but if you're going to have your it baseline with like 30 40 or more uh policies you can use groups to create things like I might have a category for general. I don't usually use subgroups yet. I haven't had a customer with enough of them to really do that. And then I'll just create another one called network. And then from there, I'm going to go back to my policies and now I'm going to add a couple of things. So I'm just going to do a search, you know, based on so, you know, we're working on some better ways to filter this, but if I look back at my sheet now, I'm just going to go hang an inherit tag as an example. A little tedious doing this. Definitely want to do it in pipeline. You can inherit a tag if it's missing too. And so I'm going to add that inheritance. Uh, I'm going to also add another one, let's say for uh, locations as an example, allowed locations. I'm going to add um, that I need, let's see, for network, I'll do. Um, see what we come up with here. Let's see what public IP, since I mentioned it as an example. So <clears throat> you see it built a, someone built a custom one here. I'm just gonna add the stock. And so now I've got a few of them based on my baseline. I can now take those, of course, and, and organize those into groups. And again, this is not necessary. If you only got 10, right, you don't really need to do that. But what happens then is once you've done that, you can see here then that now these groups show up as filters. Um, so definitely something if, if you've got a number of them. We don't have an initial parameter. This is at the initial level if I wanted to hand them in, but we're going to have a policy parameter because we're going to have inherit a tag. I'm going to set the, this a little tedious as well, this part here. Uh, so the investment upfront gives you that time ten, tenfold back at least. So it, it might seem a little tedious kind of doing this, but once you get it up and running, it, it's fantastic. There's certainly ways, you know, I'm going through the portal. It's a little slower here too. Um, so for inherit a tag, if you had 10 tags, unfortunately you'd, you'd want to put in 10, you know, inherit tags. And then of course, which values you're having. And then secondly, you know, if I decided um, I'm only going to deploy in East US and East US 2, uh, I can then go ahead and save that now. So just as a recap, I basically saved it at my IT baseline. I added some policies and groups. I then added my parameter. I could have left this alone too. You can either do it when you build the definition or when I hit the assignment of that policy or initiative, I can fill it in then. And that way it's more reusable. So if we look back here, uh, sorry, wrong one. <clears throat> we might have the same policies that may be used in some of these, but when I apply it, like as an example, I might allow for larger virtual machine series in production than I do in non-production. Certainly, you know, I turn off like G series in a sandbox, get run you over a thousand bucks a month. Steve would probably like you to turn it on, but I'd recommend you turn it off. Had to get one dig in, Steve. Yeah, thanks. We're, thanks, we're Danny. together in months, so. <laughs> 
uh, exemptions I mentioned, and then I just want to show a definition, uh, and I'm going to go select all my categories, and I'm going to do custom, and you can see here I did an IT baseline here. So at this point, what I would do is I would have to hit the assignment. So one thing is, right, I created it, but it, it's not doing anything um, until I actually hit the assignment. And now what I'm going to do is I could have it live in one location, but in my hierarchy, I might say, you know what, I'm just going to deploy this to non-production. And I, here's where I can do my exclusions. So I can say, you know what, in my subscription, uh, under my network group, because maybe I don't, I might want a public IP or something. I think that was one of the ones I picked, and then I can go down through and even pick the resource um, that I can uh, that I can you know exclude, uh, and I can keep adding a bunch of those, and then I can save that, and then of course I've got my exclusions, I got my name. You can also do an assignment and have it disabled as well. This is more for like if you had applied it, maybe something went wrong, and then you want to disable it but keep it. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, remediation, and that's pretty much it for the assignment. And then once I would hit review and create here again, within five to 30 minutes, it's going to go out and it's going to deploy those policies to my subscription. And I just wanted to mention one more thing, too, that that I see often is um, so if I go into uh, let's see here, let me go back uh, here. Let's say I want, uh, I'm going to go back to that public IP one again. So they do have set, right? This is coming from GitHub from a repository. So in this case, if somebody tries to create a public IP, it's going to actually deny them from creating that, that virtual machine. So let's say because this supports deny, it also supports um, audit, or at least it used to. Uh, uh, this might be a poor example. You have the uh, use your imagination here, but um, normally what they have here is deny and then they have disabled or they'll have like um, audit if not exist, which pushes it into your compliance report. So, you know, let's say in here that this you you didn't want deny and I just want it audit. Well, sorry, I can duplicate that definition. I can have it live somewhere where I want. Um, so as an example, I could have it live at my baseline. Uh, I could change the name and description. I can obviously give it a new category, right, based on my company name. But then what I can do is let's just pretend this was one of the effects. Instead of denying somebody, I just want to see how many people are using public IPs. I can save that now and I could add that to my initiative, my blueprint. So, you know, a number of customers, they will customize these and the way to do it is duplication, make your change. The only thing is, of course, you know, you're you're you will be out of sync with uh, with what we have deployed um, in GitHub, which will happen anyway, because you're storing a copy of it. All right, so that wraps policies. I'm going to get into uh, blueprints here. So just as a recap. A blueprint allows you to deploy a number of things. And since we're on CAF here today, I'm going to do these are truly samples. Don't expect that we got, you know, if you're looking at FedRAMP, you know, we probably have most of them, but, you know, you are responsible for making sure that this has all the controls you need. Um, but we do have a CAF Foundation one. It's pretty simple, uh, but it gives you an idea of some basic ones that you might want to incorporate as like a, a favorites, you know, of, of most commonly used. Uh, and of course, we want to give this a name, so I just go you know, blueprint. And now, because I pulled in a sample, this would normally be blank, but because I have a sample, it's pulled in a bunch of policies. And in fact, here's an ARM template. Um, so in this case, I'll use Security Center here as a as a great example, because you know if you're whether it's third party or whether it's ours, you know, make sure you got some kind of security monitoring going on. I mean, we do a lot for you in the behind the scenes, but you're going to need to be notified of certain things that we don't know necessarily may or may not be an impact your application. Like as an example, right? One thing that'll show up all the time is um, secure transfer to storage. So people who are not using right here, secure transfer to storage, um, this just makes sure that you're using a secure connection when you're connecting to your storage account. So things like that, you know, um, 
because that wasn't default or, or part of the way storage was done, you know, a while back, um, you might impact an application. So before you incorporate these as well into an environment, you know, if you're doing things, um, network, uh, sorry, the public IP, you know, maybe some teams rely on public IPs on VMs. So you need to have kind of those conversations as well. So if I were to add something here in Security Center as an example, my first thing is I've got a template here that I'm deploying uh, that's going to upgrade it from free to standard. So that's kind of one thing the Blueprint's going to do. So it's going to make sure, first of all, that I've got the standard version of Security Center. And the second thing then what it's going to do is going to open up the monitoring. So in here, there's 105 different parameters, but what I can do here is decide what I'm gonna turn off and on so that I have consistency across my subscriptions. Cause I might not even use app services or um, something else, you know, some of these things that are here. But if I do, like I may not use Data Lake as an example, but if I do have them, um, I, you know, I'm either gonna have, I'll have audit if not exists. And if I'm not using them, I might turn on disable. The other thing to note is I don't have the decide right now. Again, at time of assignment, I can choose which of these are going to happen. And I'm going to show a demo of that because I didn't in the policy piece. Um, so now what I've got is this subscription is going to get a cost center uh, tag enforced. It's going to enable monitoring and security center at certain locations uh, that I'm allowed to use for resource groups and locations in general. Deploy network watcher um, in this case here. Uh, and I can remove these obviously out of here if I don't like what's in the sample. Um, Network Watcher again does interrogation of traffic and does has a lot of troubleshooting tools. So what I can do though is right here I've basically got a grouping and down below here you can see here's a resource group type stuff symbols. Here's a, something that's been applied out of subscription. But I can also here here's my artifact types. So again you're seeing the screen of my policies and I can see customer built in. So if we look back at a custom I've got a couple here. Uh, we can also look at a role assignment. This one I would do at a management group level. Um, you might have like a group that's uh, the cloud ops team, maybe for some reason, or maybe you have a team that let's say your ops team is provisioned at the management group level, right? At a higher level that gets propagated down, but maybe at the subscription level, that subscription has another team um, testers or it has, I don't know, it has some team that's not consistent with some of the other areas. Uh, what I can do there is I can say the type of role assignment, I can say they're contributors, and then I can add, you know, the AD group um, so that any subscription gets created is going to have the role of contributor and this group is going to be assigned. So I can even do that, of course, at runtime if I want. Of course, templates, this is where I really recommend that you go to some kind of pipeline, copying and pasting this stuff in is, is you know, not exactly the greatest way to do it, uh, but you can. So you can import, upload, or paste in. Uh, and then lastly, resource group properties. This again, it's there, but I would do this using policies because this is fairly limiting. Uh, you're describing what the values should be, whereas you should be doing that as part of your deployment to produce the resource group and then use an inheritance. I shouldn't say should. It works better for the customer in most cases. If you have the same tags being repeated, because maybe that whole thing is you know, one cost center, even then I would put the tag at the subscription level and, and I I don't even know if I've had a customer use this, or I don't mean to beat up on our stuff, but um, but you know I just I think there's better ways to do it than this. So, but I do find value in using it, or customers do for policy assignment, uh, ones that are more at that level. But again, try to keep your policies at the management group level and initiatives. Uh, role assignment certainly again you could do it at management group level. It really depends on how you're how you're set up. So I think the handiest thing, honestly, is really like the um, Azure Resource Manager, so you can have have your subscriptions set up the same way. If that's what you want, you know, like non-production is set up exactly the same way uh, in conjunction with management group assignments to have the same rights, you know, the same things like you can see over here, they got deploy uh, key vault log analytics, right? So basically every time they get a subscription, they're kind of building it security center, key vault log analytics. And I would say too, another common one is uh, backups because right now, right, we support backups for storage and VMs and, and other services. So uh, that's definitely a very common one as well. Same thing with blueprints. I create it. The definition is alive here. Assume. 
and you can see my baseline. You can see that there's no changes. I do have, there's one more step in blueprints. I do have the publish. And once I have it published, then I can actually assign the blueprint. And this is where I was talking about earlier, where I left the values at assignment time. So, you know, obviously I pick my subscriptions. Um, you know, I could pick multiples here, my location, all that. But what I really want to get down to is now that I'm at assignment time, you can see this is not grayed out, whereas this one is. This was set as a default in the blueprint itself. These were assigned at runtime. So I could, you know, in this case, uh, assign all of them. Maybe in production, I allow premium and in, you know, non-dev, maybe I don't or something. Or maybe as a company, we don't want to do any geo-replicated storage, which means it sends, you know, uh, uh, the data over to our region that is paired to the primary data center and you get three more copies in that second data center and then you know machine SKU. so i could pick here uh this would be a good one that you want to assign at runtime because you know you might want to in a sandbox limit it to smaller vms versus in production you may open it up to all vms you can even pick your services here so I like this one here, select the Azure resource types that you will deny as opposed to what you will allow. So it, it depends, right? If you're um, denying more services, then you might want to use the allowed. But if you're denying only a handful of services, uh, you could do that here. So pretty common, like if you, you know, if your company just doesn't have the team to support, I, of course you have Microsoft support, but I mean like having knowledge, you know, to be able to work with the customer, you know, you might want to turn off some services and log analytics and things like that uh, that you can apply and then once it's signed same thing five to 30 minutes uh, it'll be assigned and, and in and then i can go down here and i can see any any of the ones that have been assigned so you can see this one's been assigned at this subscription here's a location that they've stored it the name of it what version and if it succeeded uh, and then you can also view any assignment details or even update that assignment so i might need to add as an example uh you know a new version and by the way when you do assignments you can pick which version that you deploy you don't have to always use the latest version All right, so that covers our policies and blueprints. Uh, I'm going to skip over a couple of the bottom ones here for sake of time. Let's see here, 20 minutes left. I definitely want to cover cost management, um, show how that tagging comes into play. Uh, with cost management, again, if, if you need anything other than really basic reports, you know, the Power BI stuff that, that we had mentioned earlier is definitely the way to do that. <clears throat> so if we go down to cost analysis, course I can pick you know what level I want to see so because of my access I am just going to pick my subscription here and so once that loads in what I can do here now is I can view by different costs by resource and so on and so forth picked obviously different dates uh, but I can also pick my tags that we you know that I created here so in this case I can get my cost center tag you know and I get I'm going to pick them all because I don't have much in this in this thing but I could filter down by cost center and then the other thing I can do then is I can group by my meter subcategory so then I can see you know the different uh, items that comprise uh, that make up my bill and then you can see here I got a $500 budget because I got that set here and that's shown where I am versus my budget and secondly this is machine learning based on what my consumption is today and what my consumption will be in the future. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't allow you to do inputs on workloads that you're going to onboard. It's forecasting based on the existing applications. Hopefully that'll be featured someday. Um, budgets. So, oh, I want to mention one more thing down here. You can change these down here as well. They have a different graph. Uh, you know, you can do a number of things in here. You can share it, you can download it, you can save it, things like that as well. And the other thing is you can create a budget with alerts. So if I'm gonna create a budget in here, uh, I can add a filter. So again, scoping, I could add a filter to a cost center as an example, if I wanted to. And then I'm just say report, and I can do monthly, quarterly, annually, when my dates are and put in my $500. Uh, as soon as I do that, you can see that line appears over here and the monthly stuff that I have going on. And again, I said earlier, we'd see action groups again, and here it is, I can pick my, uh, action group, I'll pick an email in this case, and uh, I can do my notification types, my action types, of course, things like that. How oh, did I not? Oh, here we go. 
that's what I was looking for, sorry. Uh, I can also just email here as well. And then of course I got my language preference that I wanted in. Uh, so we support quite a few of those. And then once I create that, uh, depending on what my action, my conditions and alerts are, uh, we get notifications. So, you know, a lot of cases, uh, this could be sent to, of course, the owner of that budget, right? It doesn't have to go into a ticketing system. So they can set this up as well. So remember earlier when I said scoping, the only difference with them doing as long as they have the access is the fact that if we close up this window, their scope will be limited. So when we go to cost management here, if they only have access to a resource group, then they're only going to be able to do cost management for that resource group. Uh, recommendations here. This is just based on savings because we're in the cost management module. So you can see here, I purposely left the public IP after I deleted a VM just for demo purposes. Um, so I can delete an IP address, right? This is a basically an orphaned IP address. Uh, Nick sitting out there. I can go into the details and then I can decide the quick fix is going to delete it. I could postpone it if I wanted to of how long or I can uh, just dismiss it. Maybe I know, but I'm going to reuse it for another project or something. But I can also then create an alert around that. So it looks very much the same. Uh, I can do it based on the recommendation that I selected or other recommendations that Azure Advisor picked up on. So if I decide, you know, in here that I want to do consider this one, uh, I can do recommendation type or I can do a category as well on, on the different pillars and then select my impact level and that will alert me. So I kind of got a blanketed uh, alert in that case. And of course, my action groups, my alerts. And again, um, so what I would say is this. If you are creating an alert that's specific to an application in a resource group, they probably want to save their own alert to their own resource group. If it's being completely managed, these alerts through centralized IT, then have a centralized uh, resource group to store these in. So, you know, your org alignment is very important. Uh, and your business, of course, is how this is all set up. I can't show invoices and payments, but they are there if you have. Uh, my subscriptions, of course, access reservations. I briefly mentioned, uh, you know, you can now do one and three year deals on a bunch of different services. So these used to be called, I um, uh, can't even remember now, uh, reserved instances. And now they've been, you know, reservations because we have all these different services here. So uh, one thing, the reason why I'm opening this up is if you're, this is so important. If you are doing a, a chargeback model at a resource group level, and let's say I go virtual machine, okay? And now you can see up here, my scope is shared, means it goes across my entire enterprise agreement, which means any subscription at all. I can also scope it to a single subscription, or I can scope it to a resource group. Now, here's why that's important. If I am doing my billing at a subscription level, then have my scope at the subscription level. If I'm doing my billing based on resource groups, which is the most common in a newer model, then, um, keep my reservation at that level and here's why if i go and stop this virtual machine that it gets assigned to um azure looks around and says where else can i apply this reservation to make sure my customers getting the best discount they could possibly get so now it looks inside the resource group can't find one it now because of my scoping is at a subscription or a shared level uh because of that it could attach itself to a virtual machine that's in a different resource group that belongs to a different project and a different cost center. Um, and I can't force it to come back. So again, if you are, depending on what your billing scope is, that is what your reservation scope should be. Because if not, that person who thought they were getting that one or three year, or that team that thought they were getting one or three year discount, uh, they stopped the machine at night for some reason, or maybe they had to do a patch and install, and now it's bounced around. Uh, next month's bill, they're gonna be paying basically the full price for that virtual machine. And somebody else on another team is getting their discount. That's the only reason why I want to mention that. Uh, of course, the configuration is all the stuff we've been talking through already. I will mention, though, we do have a connector for AWS uh, that you can add. It's 1% of whatever it is you process, and it tells you a little bit about the billing here. Uh, of course, you got to put in the properties and all that, but uh, but there's lots of third, you know, third-party tools as well that'll do AWS, GCP, and and um, Azure. 
Uh, let's see here, exports, oh yeah. Um, so this just pushes out to a storage account. It does not email out, unfortunately. Um, so you do need a storage account for that, but depending on you know how you're doing your reporting and maybe you're you know pushing this into a data warehouse where you already have other billing information from other clouds or from whatever, uh, you can certainly do that as well and push out to a format to consume. Uh, let's see here. All right, we should be able to do monitor and advisor. Uh, monitor, so again, the dashboard that you saw me show earlier, it came from here. So if I were to take this down, explore, uh, of course, I got to set my scope. <clears throat> now I'm going to pull in my Contoso. And I'm going to set my scope with that because I got lots of stuff. I am going to set this to virtual machines. Uh, and I'm going to say east. And so what I've said now is basically every virtual machine in Contoso Hotels that's in the ES, uh, sorry, East region. And then I am going to now, you know, most common one of course is like CPU, right? So my percentage of CPU, and I'm just showing an average, I can show counts and all that stuff. Um, I can add another filter if I wanted to, like a resource group name so I can get a little more specific as well. Uh, I can also change that from you know, a line chart to a bar chart. Uh, I can change the time. I can also pin it to the dashboard. And that's how I had um, basically created, I didn't create the dashboard, sorry, the one that I demoed. And you can see here that I can pick the dashboard to pin that to, and then I can move it around and do whatever. Uh, but also I create a new alert rule. So now, you know, again, got my scope up here. Whenever I create a condition, of the average being over 90%, then I am going to send an email. And in this case, or sorry, I'm going to create a ticket. So I want someone to take an action on it. And then, of course, save my alert. Create that alert rule. And then this is going to create a ticket anytime the average CPU is greater than 90% uh, over 15 minutes. And it gives me an estimated cost for um, basically having this monitor metric in place. I can share this as well, uh, so you can copy the link or download to Excel as well. But again, you know, it just gives you depending on what it is. And then you can search logs as well. So this is in the log analytics workspace. We do have a number of built in uh, things that you can do. You can also go to our GitHub repo, of course, uh, get more queries and solutions here. Uh, so you can see them, you know, that we've got a lot of solution queries that are already written. Um, so let me see if this one interesting. Uh, container insights here. So here's one that's already has an alert built for containers as an example. So um, things like that you can absolutely use too. So there's a lot of integration you'll see with, with these. Uh, I can also change the resource type as well. Um, so I'll just pick this. So if you wanted to troubleshoot, you know, more like networking type things, I can come down here to my express route circuits and then I could do that. Or um, let me see for me, virtual machines, you know, I can see uh, virtual machine free disk space or VM availability or errors or, you know, so we got a lot of these queries written for you. Uh, and again, you can get more from uh, GitHub as well. Uh, I already talked about alerts and actions. So we got that. Of course, I, these are very common ones that you see in every single area of the logs. Uh, but then we also have for the monitoring, it can get very specific into certain services. So how this one here is set up, if you look at this, this is uh, App Insights, which, which is really meant for applications. So when you look at this, you know, we got different monitoring uh, for different areas that can certainly come together. But this is more around your metrics and availability and failures and things like that. Um, so do come with the dashboard, but what I wanted to mainly point out is under the metrics, I'm sorry, under the diagnostics, uh, where is that? It's failures, uh, no. I'm not seeing that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong thing. Um, you're not going to set up your diagnostics here. You're going to set up your service to have diagnostics. I'll show that here in a bit. Um, you do need to, so as an example here, I'll go on the resource group and let me see if I can find a web app. Uh, app service slot, let's see here. All right, this should have a diagnostics. There we go. This is what I'm looking for, diagnostic settings. So these are different based on services. Uh, and basically, you know, different services are going to have different things. So here's your log options. 
Uh, these are pretty much the same. You can send it to log analytics for reporting, Azure Monitor, things like that. You can archive the storage, and inside that storage, you can do lifecycle management, which you can set here as well. Uh, and then lastly, you could stream to Event Hub and be consumed by other services. But if I were to go into, let's see here, a virtual machine as an example, it's going to have a bit of a different collection. So if we look at the diagnostics down here, oh, I don't have it turned on. I think I have it turned on for this one maybe. Yeah, uh, so you can configure then your performance counters, you know, your logs and things like that, your crash dumps, your sinks, your agents, all of that stuff. So you, you have control on what's going to get flowed in there or flowing in, I should say. And then from there, of course, you can set up your um, Azure monitor uh, to be able to work with that. Same thing, you know, storage accounts, they have different diagnostic settings uh, that you can add in there as well. This just gives some basic insight here on these pages. Uh, networks is coming out here. It's in preview right now, uh, but uh, we do have a traffic analytics as well that if you turn on your flow logs, you can get more data as well. But we have some things here around connectivity, uh, traffic and things like that. Actually, let me change the subscription because this one here should have more. Um, so yeah, we can see some of the things that these are network security groups. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we can see in here. Fortunately, not today. Okay, front door looks like that's healthy, but I can go into you know the details of that, see how that's operating, uh, and then I can of course set up those metrics. I can set up the diagnostic settings, so I can do this at my application level. Um, so if I were, you know, if I'm here and I go to my resource groups, and of course I, I where's my network? There we go. And I want to do mine, you know, I can go in here and basically set up these diagnostic settings uh, for my application. So Central IT could set up the repository, but it might be the app team that actually does the configuration. advisor all right so we're on the on the back end here um so with this one let's see here let me get a couple hotels oops there okay <clears throat> so now i got two subscriptions uh, i can see my earlier one where i got the quick fix uh, and I can see different things. So this one here is, is my security stuff. Again, uh, quick fix here. I can go in and see log analytics. Um, I can, so this is actually in Security Center now. So this is, uh, which is good because we need to get to that. Um, but here's one thing, again, very important, multitasking. Um, so if you are doing using uh, pipelines and you're using an ARM template or Terraform or Ansible or whatever, do not remediate in the portal. And the reason for it is this is going to push out this ARM template. And now your template that you have in your code repository is going to be out of sync with what's deployed in Azure. And the next time you do a deployment, it's going to wipe out that remediation that just happened. What you want to do is take this script. You're going to put it into your application, uh, or maybe you have centralized templates and you want to upgrade those templates. Next time it gets deployed, um, it'll it'll get corrected. And so you can see the same thing every time. It's description remediation. These are in, um, uh, this is in the retail, sorry, the Contoso, so I don't have access, but you could remediate these. Uh, and you can also trigger a logic app. So you could build a logic app. Let's say if it wasn't able to remediate, like sometimes there's not an option to remediate, uh, but you can trigger a logic app that would have maybe the script in here uh, that will go through and update those scripts in your repository as an example or something like that. Uh, so again, it breaks it down into the different pillars, reliability, uh, virtual machine replication here. So see the reliability score uh, shows what's been impacted, uh, things like that. You can postpone or dismiss that. You can look at that in more detail uh, under advisor. So it'll give you a lot more information. So this one here is for Azure Site Recovery as a replication. So it's basically taking you to that screen to configure it. So you, you got a number of different things, right? If it's like um, encrypt the disk with BitLocker, well, that's, you know, some of these things 
you know, you could script it, but might be manual. Or if it's a security update, we'll link out um, to the um, update that we had published. So depending on how you come in, what it is, uh, let's see, is there anything in performance? Uh, yeah, unsupported Kubernetes is detected. We can see all the recommendations, but these really work closely hand in hand, especially on the security tab. Um, with Security Center. And the quick fixes usually means it's deploying a script. And then I'll just go into one that, that does not have a quick fix. In this case, it's giving you this, uh, the description. Here's your remediation. So again, here's your logic. This one really should have a, an ability to deploy. I'm not sure why. Um, and then I can pick you know, which ones I want to remediate. So here's my selected resources. This is what it's going to deploy. Again, if I was doing all portal, that's fine. If not, uh, update your uh, ARM template or Terraform template or Ansible or whatever it is you have. So your alerts again, right? Same thing. You can have an advisor one. So anything related to these scope condition and then of course how you're going to notify people. And then uh, let's see here if I can just give a quick whirlwind of security. So, sorry folks, I normally do like a couple of hours or more with this, but uh, I know it's nighttime, so but what I, I'll just go over a couple of things. You know, you want to look at your security score for improvements, as an example. It shows my subscriptions here and how they're doing and what the recommendations I might have for those. And then from there, uh, you can dig into this. So I can see some red going on here. Uh, so it looks like I have some vulnerabilities here. And in this case now, uh, this could be a read. This could be an access problem if it's in. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can find one that I can pull up. There we go. All right, so here's one here for mine. I have some ports that are open and I just created those today. So I could go through here uh, and see what it's going to do. It's going to basically uh, remediate and close those ports off uh, on that machine. Is my I think that's what it's doing here, but uh, so you can see, yeah, overly permissive. Um, these machines get turned off, so I'm not really worried. I'm just there's nothing on them. I was using this as a demo to show how a DNS load balancer would work. So there's nothing on the machine or anything. Now somebody could compromise it and do stuff with it, but I did turn off the public IP and some of that stuff, so can't do a whole lot. And they're they're turned off, you know, with except for an hour a day or so. We do have DDoS protection built in as well. Uh, plus we do offer it to you as a service, but we do a lot of that in the background. Uh, I wanted to mention just a couple of things here. So security score, you know, it's a lot of the stuff that you just saw, but you can do regulatory compliance. So if you do have a need for ISO and some of these things, you can see our CSI benchmark. You know, it's the same thing, secure transfer here. It's gonna show a little script uh, that would go out and basically, and this is one that I would have a policy. So this never even happens. And so you can see just support HTTPS traffic as an example, but I would have a policy that we saw earlier that said only secure transfer to storage is supported and that way this wouldn't even show up uh, but one thing i did want to show you is you can manage these as well so i can go in to where these are and i think contoso is my best one and then i can go in and see uh, how how we're doing and uh, enable these if i had the rights i can add a custom initiative as well and i can look at an effective policy so right here i could turn some of these on i can also if i could click this there's more like there's a canadian thing and there's a, i think there's a european so we do have a number of those uh, that you can do out of the box for compliance as well and how are we doing for one minute uh Security, uh, nothing there really worth talking about. Uh, coverage, of course, what you do have covered. So this one here is talking about the plan that you have turned on and what services you have. So here you can see the difference for Security Center on what we offer for free and what we offer for um, for you know the standard version. And then you turn off and on services as you need them. So if you don't have you know container registries, you're just going to turn that off, right? Or Key Vault or something like that. Uh, okay, so I. Apologize for the whirlwind tour, uh, but I think this gives people enough of, hey, here's some best practices to consider. Here's some areas. I'm going to send out a summary of, of links and some materials. Uh, if you guys can just let me know where you want that, Stephen, probably just send it over to you through Microsoft, can I, or something? Yeah, that that works, and then I'll get it to Vibob and put it on our site. Or, or okay. Oh, it. I have Vibob. I have your email. 
Um, yeah, I can send you one. Working. I'll send both you and Steve. Yeah, so I'll send those out, guys. And if you got any questions, you know, shoot me an email, certainly. Uh, myself and Steve, uh, we can help you with any of this stuff. And I would say, you know, that's your whirlwind tour of, you know, how to set up a foundation. Uh, and I did mean to show one thing that I'm going to include uh, that I didn't. I will do that. Just take one minute so you know what the heck I've attached here. Uh, so right here, uh, this is kind of what it looks like, you know, in, in if we were to take these management groups uh, and we were to now put that into an actual design, you know, it could look something like this where, uh, Basically, we have our connection. There's my shared services, right? That's where I'm going to have my blueprints. Some customers break this out into like uh, networking subscription, identity subscription, so on and so forth. They, or if they have a lot of logs, they might do one for that, but it is a shared. And that way, when you're connecting up your other subscriptions, you don't have to redo the uh, express route or VPN or whatever you're using to on-premise. If you're doing that, you just need to connect the spoke over here back to the hub. Uh, you can see my sandbox is not connected because because, you know, we give it a lot more leeway. But the biggest advantage is, you know, you have less duplication of cross services. That's probably the biggest thing. It's the ease of management. It's the speed that you can connect these things up and deploy your workloads. And that's really what it comes down to. Great session, okay. Kenny, I think. Great stuff. Do you have a couple of minutes for going through I the do. questions that we have? Absolutely. All right. Let's see what we so, got so here. So James and Kiran have sent, asked a couple of questions primarily related to policies. James has asked around uh, is tagging based on policy smart enough to apply a tag based on VM name matching up pattern. So can we really um, do a uh, resource can, name? We don't have anything out of the box for that first one, that question from James. Uh, we do have it for um, you could you could probably do a custom one on that. Let me think. Smart apply to based on the machine name. Hmm. Uh, I believe we can do it on a single VM name. What I'm not sure of is if we can actually match it against a regex pattern or something. Oh, definitely no regex. Yeah, not not yet at least. Yeah. Uh, and on the same lines, Kiran has asked if uh, his his use case is also around WVDs. And he's asking, can we add uh, appropriate tag values based on the user who is going to uh, log into the who's it, Azure AD profile um, is linked to that? W you're not going to like in FS logic or something. Yeah, you're not going to be able to tie it into the, the specific user. Now, what you could do is do more of a model where it's a one to one for the desktop, and then you could apply a tag to the VM uh, and then charge it back that way. But and I see what you're trying. I see what you're doing. You're almost doing like a cost per session or something, maybe, Kieran, are you? Yeah, yep. that's a good feedback, though. It says, yeah, tag. For I think kind of you got charge back the, based on the user. Yeah. Basis. I think that it automatically adds that cost center tag. OK, I do quite yeah. a bit of WVD work. That's that's something I can bring back uh, to the team. I never. Yeah, I mean, you know, unless you have to do that stuff, sometimes you don't think about it. Matching against string pattern. Yes, exactly. There's your string pattern. Okay, so yeah, but you're not going to do a regular expression. That's definitely not supported. And Kiran is also asking for this architecture diagram. I believe you said, yeah. Kenny, you're going to share that, Ryan. I am. I'll share the source files too, so you guys can modify and use them on your own. All right, and I, I have a couple of questions for you, Kenny. So uh, I believe when you were showing those quick starts for cloud adoption framework, I think it works great for organizations which are uh, just coming on and which are getting onboarded on Azure. But do you have any any suggestions for organizations who are already in their cloud journey halfway or wherever? And because it gets difficult, you were showing that management groups hierarchy where you had Azure 1.0 and then mm -hmm. you have uh, the other management groups. Yeah, so exactly. That's a good idea. Do you have any other uh, yeah, so, this, so here's the thing, right? Like putting these things in retroactively, you can do it. There, there's no reason why you can't. It's a lot more work. And most customers are kind of like, okay, we just need a proper one. We're tired of the way we're doing it. Or like I said, they got a couple of point solutions. If you're more mature, 
honestly, it doesn't differ a whole lot, then you might be bringing some bad habits with you. Um, but we do look at trying to help refactor it into something like this. Like I do go in some places where like shared infrastructure, as an example, is, is shared. It's a network hub. But what they've done is they may have attached workloads into that VNet. So what I'll do in that case that might be different for someone more mature is we will move. Either we will move that hub which is worse, but uh, but if there's not that many workloads, we'll move those workloads out because really all you should have on that hub is really your domain controllers because they're a shared asset uh, from a networking perspective, right? I mean, there's other things like MBAs, of course, and you know, uh, fire, sorry, um, like a F5 big IP WAF or something like that. They could be centralized as well. But it's pretty much, you know, I pretty much go to the same things. I don't have to train people as much maybe when they're more mature, but I do have to, um, people get in the habit of doing the same things the same way and it happens in Azure too, even though it's, you know, it does uh, grow at a, an alarming rate. Uh, people do leave those old patterns in place or they brought forward uh, an on-premise design. So what I'm getting at is no matter where they come from, I find I'm still doing this every single time of setting up a new one in a new area. Um, or if we can, we do try to salvage and refactor what they have we can. But in a lot of times, man, it's just too difficult or like, you know, maybe they're using public IPs everywhere and now you got a bunch of audits showing up and, you know, the application relies on the public IP. They got to talk to all the app owners. It, it, it's a pretty big job if you got a lot out there. And that's what uh, I believe, because if sometimes those simple things also become difficult. For example, if we have older resources which we cannot delete, those yeah. even don't comply with our naming standard and we just can't do anything with them. Exactly. So what I do recommend is build out this platform and then look at what you want to migrate out of the old way you were doing things. The more of those you can migrate, um, but they're hard to justify, right? The application's up and running, True. it's been paid for. Uh, who's going to pay for that migration <laughs> and testing and, and, and all that? So awesome. I see a lot, to be honest, where they kind of move it down here. And what they do is they look at the environments that are down here. And this Azure 1.0, this might have more management groups under it. And they might do it by application and then look at it and go, okay, what policies could I implement for this? So you can really, you know, this I, is an unknown for me until I work with the customer. But yeah, a lot of times they're doing more of a hierarchy underneath here. All right. Michael, you have a question? Yeah. Um you know, basically I'm in a situation where everything's under that root subscription that is like created by default. Yes. So in, you know, reading the documentation, basically you have to go and you have to like elevate your privileges, even to go in and um, like start to manage that. And what's not clear in the documentation to me is what kind of risk that I have, even from introducing anything outside of that root management group and how it affects yeah. like all your different, um, all your different roles that people have under that root subscription for you know billing reading and all that stuff so um, totally. let me, let me it, uh, to, okay. to, to combine with that i've got the additional complexity of course of that um you know we're not using the normal uh well we use this cisco, Mor cisco Meraki appliance oh um, man that's funny i'm doing a project on that right now of so a call me yeah. when you're done <laughs> no idea what the hell i need to do to get because what I'd love to do is I'd like to get them in a management group, separate out some script subscriptions. The thing yep. is, I've got that Meraki appliance in there. Yep. It's very different than what I've worked with before. So yeah. for me, what I've had to do, even to have the 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 separate the dev test subscription created, I basically ended up having to buy a second Meraki appliance and put in that dev set test right. subscription. But right. I don't know if that was really my only capability or if that's what the networking people at the organization I'm working at with. Well, yeah, Michael, you might even limit it by your design in Azure. Like if you had this type of design with a hub, you could have your Meraki. That's another device that could sit in the shared hub because it is a shared service among all these. And then what I would have is like a, a load balancer on the front end, right? And have high availability with two, at least two VMs per region. Um, and that's where these things get expensive, whether it's like an SD-WAN type solution or even like a F5 big IP WAF, right? Um, so the more you can centralize, so reduce the amount of regions you're deploying to, have mm -hmm. a primary and secondary in each geopolitical boundary. Secondly, make sure it's behind a load balancer, make sure those virtual machines are in an availability set or zone. Mm -hmm. 
And then lastly, try to centralize it with your hub if you can, because then you can get reuse from dev tests and production and all that stuff. That's what I would love to see. So yeah. I had the recommendation to present to the organization, um, especially if it was, you know, published by you instead of me in a diagram. <laughs> yeah, I'll be right. talking into it. Yeah, uh, let me think here. Uh, in some of the links, I might have a networking link in there, but it's going to show you kind of a similar hub and spoke design. Uh, but you got my email, so you can certainly ping me with some questions in that. Uh, as far as the Meraki, what we're doing on that project, what did, did we just had to use. Oh, lastly, yes, user defined routes. Anytime you put in a third party, uh, mm -hmm. you, you need to have your user defined routes. That's really. <laughs> I can't speak to the configuration of the Meraki because you know it's it's a third party product. So we work with that third party partner at that time. So that you know they're looking at the configuration of their product, they're looking how it, it will integrate onto the platform, and then kind of so it's a customer plus us plus Cisco in that case. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, and then I wanted to show, so back to, what was the question? Hang on now, someone was asking, oh, you were asking, Michael, was you was asking about the man. I just want to address that, so I think that's a really um, good question is, you know, you were asking, why can I not get this to present? Let me try this one more time. So, one thing is, uh, I've just got to find this slide. So, how do you prevent, what was your permissions question again? You were like, how do you, oh, management groups for permissions. Okay, uh, so go here's what I'd recommend with that, if I can find the slide here. There we go. All right, this is what I'm looking for. Okay. <laughs> So right here, this is your enterprise. Now, you may not have an enterprise agreement, do you? No, just the we you don't. Have provisioning. So here's what I would say is this provisioning account right here, that provision subscription, whether you're on pay as you go or whatever, are you able to do a service principal for that account to provision in your case? Um, I think I read some of the documentation where it's also kind of tied up with uh, like that, that credential is also kind of tied up with our um, the AD yeah. in there, and it scared me because I don't want to go and break what they've built. Right. I mean, um, what I would say for that management group, here's what typically customers do who have an EA. This is a service principal as an account owner. Mm -hmm. They provision the subscriptions, and they also use that service account to provision to provision the management groups. And they and there's only obviously a handful of people that'll have access to that. Um, and and they, that's how they're doing it. So they're separating it from an actual user, and they're using the service principal to do that stuff. And then that's what they log in to do some of that high level, and that way they don't have to elevate privileges because that privilege already exists. Okay, so the fact that I'm not an AEA shouldn't be a factor here. Right. Yeah, sorry, in Active Directory, you mean? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 because basically this is, this is the EA Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, you know, I do you know what program you're on? Are you on just a straight page to go or are you on like a CSP program? Do you know? Yeah, I'm not straight page to go anymore. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's an MCA or something like that now, I think. Steve, do you know what that is? Yeah, the Microsoft Cloud Agreement. It's a new it's a new agreement. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's similar to an SCE. It's supposed to be, a, a, but it, it's direct with, with a LAR or Microsoft, right? It's not credit card based account. It, it's a it's a real agreement. Okay, so they can, so do you think they, do they get access to the EA portal? Well, that I don't think so, but I'm not 100% positive. I think the EA I portal believe, eventually is going away, right? It is, yeah, it's almost gone now. I believe MCA accounts doesn't, roll up to enterprise agreement doesn't right. I, think right, I think you're right by bob i think you're right one thing you could do i guess is when you create your subscriptions create them under a service principal account and create your management groups under a service principal account whoever that might be in your org uh who has access to that i that the best practice from there yeah unfortunately you'd have to be like a management group contributor or something like that to be able to do mm -hmm. some of that stuff yeah okay Yep. Uh, don't be surprised if you don't get an email. 
No problem. I'll, I'll probably shoot something out and after I do a little more discovery. Okay, sounds good. Uh, any other, yep, architectural diagram, I'll package all of that up. Uh, anything else in the questions that I might have missed? Well, okay, it looks like you guys had some conversation going here, which is awesome. I think we are good, Kenny. Okay. Thank Excellent. you so much on behalf of yeah. the user group. I would like to thank you for taking time and uh, talking through Cloud Adoption Framework. Thank you, Steve, for uh, inviting Kenny to the group. It has been great. Oh, sure, yeah. Th thank, thank you, Kenny. I appreciate it. So no problem. Steve, you know I only did this, so you get you got to owe me big time, right? That's yeah, really. I know. This is put it <laughs> on my tab. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank you. So